In the last 10 years or so, there's been a boom in films based on reimagined fairy tales. Disney is largely responsible, revisiting their copyrighted and sanitized versions of stories with live-action actors, and proving to other studios that, yes, there is a market for blandly transgressive retellings of well-trod tales. Time and again, people are paying to see these fairy tales, but critical reception has been meh. But while Disney is confined by the family-friendly values and techniques of its brand, other production companies are not. My name is Gretel, and this is my brother Hansel. We learned a couple of things while trapped in that house. One, never walk into a house made of candy. And two, if you're going to kill a witch, set her ass on fire. Hansel and Gretel Witch Hunters was silly. The premise essentially was, what if we took Hansel and Gretel, gave them a bunch of guns, and made them swear? Wouldn't that be so rock and roll? And yeah, fine, I'm not here to bash a goofy action movie. When it comes down to it, the premise just doesn't have enough there to merit discussion. To be good, a new remake of a traditional story needs to not only interpret it in a new way, but also make use of that folktale framework to have something to say. So, in comes 2020's Gretel and Hansel. It smells of cake! I'm called Gretel, and this rough one here is my brother Hansel. Ouch! The film opens by telling us explicitly it has a lesson to teach. So children, please, beware of gifts. So what gifts are being given, and what is their underlying threat? To understand how Gretel and Hansel shifts from its source material, let's first look to the original fairy tale. Hansel and Gretel was published by the Brothers Grimm in 1812, having been recorded from existing folktales. In the story, the children are abandoned by their parents in the woods due to the scarcity of food at home, only to be lured by a witch offering abundance in the form of a gingerbread house. It's a house made of candy! The witch captures the children, using Gretel as a servant and fattening up Hansel to eat. Gretel! Come here! There's work to be done! Work, work, work! She's horrible. I hate her. <laughs> cooking and killing! Killing and cooking! Oh, it's a lovely life! To free them both, Gretel must push the witch into her own fire, burning her alive. She and Hansel are then able to return home, carrying with them riches they have stolen from the witch's house to buy food for the parents who left them. Scholars have argued this story may have developed from a historic famine in 14th century Europe, during which time it was recorded that mothers abandoned and even ate their children. This problem of scarcity is present in so many historic fairy tales, but is it still relevant in the same way today? Tell me the fairy tale again. It's too scary, you know, start seeing things that aren't there. The film works from the traditional premise, but changes aspects of the narrative, focusing more on feminine power. After all, Gretel is the child who saves them in the original story. There are a number of other new elements introduced in this movie. One of the major themes of Gretel and Hansel is the price of power and knowledge. The power of the witch, and as we learn, the power latent in Gretel, is not free. The gift of magic is largely demonstrated to us through the motif of feasting. Unlike the traditional fairy tale, this witch does not live in the iconic gingerbread house. But though the cottage itself is inedible, the children are still lured by the smells coming from the food inside, prompting Hansel to break in, giving the film a plot more like Goldilocks. In making this choice, director Oz Perkins is able to circumnavigate the problem an edible house represents. It is inherently unsustainable. Eating the house destroys it. Without the intervention of the witch, the children would be left once again both without food or shelter. And though the children discuss cake, sweet foods are not the focus of their feasting. Inside the cottage, beautiful and bountiful spreads of food are laid out for the hungry children. And because they're starving, they eat. However, Gretel is quick to offer their help as payment, not willing to accept this bounty as pure charity. She understands from the beginning that this blessing must have a cost. We just don't yet know what that cost is. 